And death will never with that And for them waste men we hit the kitchen and that With that wet work dripping My network click Alright, we're here at the first ever Blue History Month exhibit um, Today is just about celebrating the leaders and pioneers from my community um, I grew up in Lewisham, I was raised on Saxon Sound I grew up listening to rap bandin from Ski, like Ski and Tommy and like, even Jack and then Obviously, I grew up with friends that were in OG, so for me, sound system culture has been very imperative for Lucian, Um and it's one of the things that connects our family tree. So today, I just wanted to put on an event where I can champion these people from my community. Like, I want to give people awards, so then they get the uh, accreditation that they deserve from the community. Like, we have to uplift our own champions. We can't look to outside people or the outside industry. We have to do it from in our community, and that's why I wanted to put today on. Um, I'm working with Jack and Tommy to make this happen, like, it's been amazing man. Um, they're my OGs innit man, you have to get the hood past before you can make teams go on innit. So for me, it was just about connecting the right people and making sure like the stitches for this event is are fully embedded so then we can continue this annually because we're growing and I honestly believe if our people in our community came together like the other corners of London, we would run the industry. You know this man, we already run things and we always have but we just need to unite and yeah that's what today's about. My name's Darcy Thomas by the way so I'm the uh, curator, uh, organiser, uh, I produce TV for a living, um, but I'm an artist as well, yeah, so that's basically it. And by running today, I'm literally just following suit on what these lot have been doing for decades, so I'm trying to continue the legacy, um, yeah, and it's important that we keep this going on, and it's for our kids' kids, and our kids' 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 kids, is it? Because even though I don't know Dennis, I grew up listening to Dennis, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone in this room grew up listening to Dennis. Jack, Tommy, where you at? Thank you, James. Yeah, so the entertainers, they came around in 1981, where it was um, Rankin Coley, um, Rankin Coley, Papa Levi, Desi Kojak. That was in 81, when we, 80, 81. So when we started to roll now, you know, other people learnt the skill and went to do a thing, so it was Desi Kojak, Levi, Rankin Coley, which is Michael Cole, rest in peace. He was really the first man who had the idea what I had. So it was him, then Levi, then Desi Kojak, then Melo. Yeah. Because Melo, he, he's really a strong arm when you're talking about Saxon. Because even if you're going to say Maxi Priest, Melo is the man behind him. It was me as well, but like Melo was the man, you know, like gave Maxi Priest songs or stood beside him and gave him encouragement. So, you know, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things. And for me to talk it right now, it's going to be hard. But there's a lot of things that happened around Saxon in building it, in playing it. In every way you can think of there was a problem and there's always going to be a problem. But the only thing what you can be rest assured is if the sound's playing, it does the job. That's number one. Secu that's a security. If, if Saxon's going to be playing in somewhere big, nine times out of ten we will be prepared before we get there. So everything's good. I'm not going to say it's always going to be prepared properly, but it gets prepared. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, but you've got to be real, innit? You can't say, yeah, everything's good. It's not always good. Sometimes you have to be straight and say, it could be better. To benefit the gentlemen that are around you, obviously, you spoke about Maxi, but I know that you played a part in developing each of these gentlemen's careers. Um, shall I start with Scheme first and then lead over to you two? Scheme, could you tell me how Dennis helped you? How uh, didn't he help me? <clears throat> Simple, no Dennis role, no scheme. Yeah, no scheme. Can't say no SE1, 4 slash 8, but I'm part of them too. 
because when they weren't getting on shows, I'm one of the first people to put them on shows. So he's the family tree, basically, of most of the music that comes from this area in some way or another, passed through Saxon, and then his sons, Kieran, <coughs> so on, Tyrone, big, big, big on the grime scene. So basically, a lot of the artists that you see out there now going number one, they're part of they're part of their success. These sons were sitting down with me in studio when they was young, so I've known them from the start, gave them encouragement from the start. I was sitting down watching Philip Levi, who's over there in the corner, trying to stay anonymous, who is probably the best MC for me ever out of this country. And it will ice a lot of people right now. Yeah, so I was growing up listening to Philip Levi, I was growing up listening to Smiley Culture. I'd be in studio. When I was first rapping, I'm in studio and Levi's telling me that I'm good. Are you mad? That's all I needed. You understand? And Saxon used to play down the end of my road. I grew up on Childers Street, which is a garrison in them days. And um, Saxon used to be place, basically play at the end of my road sounds like Itress from Brixton Far Right the prettiest sound I've ever seen at that time um, and I, I literally could hear the music echoing off the blocks on a Sunday while I'm eating my dinner so I just want to eat my dinner get my roller skates on and I'm going down to Saxon in the pen and then as a youth I was brave enough to go out for the mic certain times so I chatted on Saxon when I was probably about 7 years of age I don't know if you even remember that. Um, and Breda, I think one time Breda was Bernard was even mixing me down. Chatted on Spectra. So where I grew, I grew my thing, what I was into, I grew in, I couldn't have grown in a better spot, better place. So when I started rapping, doing music, the first place I was going to go was going to look for the big man, innit? So he was getting into rap at that time but more conscious kind of rap. And that's where he was trying to push me. I had that in me, but I was on the roads at that point. So I didn't really want to hear too much of that. But I saw, I saw a video on Operation Blue, and I think you was going more into the girl music then. And was that around the same time that you had that? No, that was way after. <laughs> Basically, I'll be honest, I'm in, a, I'm in a thing with a lot of people that know me. I used to, when, when he first met, had me in studio, Overcliff 22, it was still um, real to real and all that, yeah? I was hustling them times there. So like, I'll be licking a 16, the man's fixing it up on the real to real. It's not like the computers and all the shit you lot get now. It's a proper process. So they're fixing up the thing. I'm going out, licking some dots, coming back, it's fixed up, boom, 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 boom. So that's how it used to go. Once I, I was licking a tune, as my usual routine, with a guy called Don Lucci. I keep on forgetting him anytime I talk on these things. Don Lucci, which is a producer that worked with everybody, Levi, everybody. Yeah, and um, I licked this tune anyway. I licked at 16, ran out to go and do what I was doing come back, I'm coming down the stairs in Overcliff and I could hear Half Pine is on my tune. But as we're the youths in the studio, you've got people like Half Pine, you've got certain other people coming around. If you're doing something and they're feeling it, you might end up not on it. You feel me? <laughs> <laughs> on the car, you know, right, right. That's like, oh, Listen, but I weren't having that anyway. Yeah, I was one of the first youths around that weren't having that. So anyway, I've come back and then I've realized the dreads put a chorus on my thing. So I'm saying, rah, I've got a tune with half pine on the chorus. So I've gone, I licked another 16. I come out of the booth, I come out of the booth, Lennox Lewis is standing up there. So he's saying to me, are you that? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Bruv, I've gone and licked another, come back, I thought Michael Jackson might be on the tune next, but <laughs> nah, it, it did done there. But this brother here, the, the links in music, the type of people I've seen come around him, want to come around him, people have no idea. The history is deep, it's long, man, and um, lots of people have benefited off of it. And um, 
lots of people don't mention it enough and don't say where they actually come from or where the root is and where the foundation is and um I ain't never gonna say nothing and don't mention Saxon sound. Saxon is my sound eternal, you're mad. You understand? D roll. Don't care what anyone's got to say about him, D roll in my book. Always. You understand? So Right, Jack. Can you explain to me? So like as the founder of Blue Borough, how did how did that go about? How did you set up Blue Borough? Basically started the Blue Borough was just like I don't know, it was just like an idea. It was like a word in a song. Um, like, what I was writing, I was, I was just, I was basically in pen, in it, And, um, I don't know, I was just writing, and I just, obviously I had never written before, so it was just the first for me, and I just thought I wanted to just describe, like, where I'm from. But I didn't want to just make it normal, so I just, I just tried to give it some thought, and then obviously I started thinking about the borough, and I just started thinking about like the basics of the borough, like breaking it down, like what makes the borough the borough, you get me? And then I realised it was like colour coded, and then obviously I just said, yeah, it's blue borough, so then I just put that in my bar, never thought nothing of it, just carried on with my bird. <laughs> came out and then obviously when I spat the bar to the man then like then this went nuts. I was like, rah, what the hell's that? And I was like, it's the ends, isn't it? And then it was like, okay, let's go. So then yeah, we just cracked on and then I just said, Bones, this is what's going on and I just gave him like ideas of what I had in my head of just us rapping. You get me? And obviously that was so out of our comfort zone that we didn't really know what to do with it, but to just try and get shows and rap. But like Scheme said, we couldn't get anywhere, so we didn't really know no one in music. It was just Scheme, d row So like, it was like, okay, cool, boom, Scheme got us our first show. Always thankful for that. And because from there, it's like, everything just changed. And then it's like, yeah, it just all started from there. The Blue Barrel was just born. And we just kept it moving, man. We didn't even think about no strategies. We just kept it moving. We just loved the stage. We just loved spitting. And we just loved the support. That that really drove us, because it was instant. It weren't a build-up. It weren't something we had to work on. The borough just immediately got behind everything we was doing. And it was just, it was just like a blessing to see, man. And we just, it made it easy. Yeah, it made it easy. We just cracked on and kept it moving. So yeah, that's how the Blue Borough actually came around in my head. And yeah. Tell me about Yusuf's relationship. So, how did you get involved in music? Well, I didn't really meet Jack Jones. <laughs> you know, we're from a, a legendary estate called Milton Court Estate, where everyone is basically family, even if you never know your family. Someone else's mum can drag you up and tell you to behave yourself. We're, we're from that era, so it's all been family. So I'm, I've known Jack all my life, but like he said, he was doing a sentence. And I remember I seen him one night, I was with Tyrone now on Honeypot. So I was with Tyrone one night and sitting down in his car, and Jack come over. But like, I don't know if you know when you're on a roll, if a man's not looking the right way, you're not even interested in what he's really saying. So he was fresher, I was like, ah, he's like, do you rap? I was kind of embarrassed to say, yeah. So I said, all right, yeah, maybe. Then he came back again, six months later or so, looking like a whole different guy. <laughs> now I believed. And at the same time, me and um, a friend called Zagai, he was always filming, he was filming, just filming each other. Just bought, he used to buy everything, he would buy every, every gadget going. So we just got a camcorder one day, started filming each other put it on the TV and thought, wait a minute, we look like the guys that we're watching. So we thought, why are we, why are we watching them? Let's watch us. The next thing you know, Jack came, he come with that Blue Borough rhyme, he was like, Blue Borough, what's that? He told us the colour coding, from then my mind has started working like, this is a chance tonight, in, intertwine every area into one movement. Because for years it's just been New Cross and Deptford. For years. So, you know, then we made it Catford. 
Grove Park, Sydenham. Brockley's always been part of the family, but there's been loads of other areas that weren't mentioned yeah. in the same breath. Yeah. So it, ma it now made everyone intertwine as one. There's no more, you're from ghetto, you're from the blue borough, which means we're all now one family. So that was how we started the blue borough. For me, that's a very important part because the main thing is a lot of our music infrastructure was built on Ilderton Road and in New Cross, as Dennis pointed out to me. Dennis, could you tell us about the infrastructure on Ilderton Road and why probably that was a prevalent part of the blue? And then we had to branch out. Really what it was, yeah, Phillips. You know that brand, Phillips, what makes the ring. What, what makes the razors and makes all, everything else. Phillips was the first one to make a um, uh, turntable. The first turntable was made by Phillips. Yeah, that, that was a 78. You know them 10 inch ones? Yeah, yeah. yeah they was made by Phillips and then the vinyl came in. Yeah, but it was Phillips that made the actual machine. Presto. Yeah, so this is why records, when you used to buy records from America, it was so expensive because they suppress it here, send it back to America, and then America would send it back to here. Remember, the tunes used to be plastic up when they came from America. So, they, they so, so it, it's it, an import. import. Yeah, it was an import, but you're paying for the flight for it to go to America and for the flight to come back from America. Do you remember an LP in the early 80s? Um, an American LP was 16 pounds, 15 pounds, you know what I mean? And that was the flight money we was paying for. Try to mic. So, Ilderton Road, you see where them flats are in Ilderton Road? All of that was pressing plants. So that's why they press for the whole world. Jamaica and everywhere. That's where they used to press the record. So, obviously years go past and then America's got in. Years go past, Jamaica's got in. You know what I mean? But the beginning was Phillips, St. Phillips' is Ilderton Road, where they call Love Lynch. Right. Question Were there any UK artists that used that to their advantage? So, like, would press say, the thing, say that again, say that. Was there any UK artists that would use that to their advantage? So, like, get impressed on Ilderton Road, but still charge the import? No, 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 because uh, 1982. They, they broke up, so they sold some stuff to some people, and then they went to Harsden, which is still there today, it's called Broadpress. Mm. But that's Phillips' stuff. How did that switch up your business? How did that affect your business? How did that switch it, up your It didn't business? affect my business, because it made the business, if you are pressing records, it made it all easy. Because, especially if you're talking about reggae, the capital of reggae is, where would you say is the capital of reggae? Say so Kingston, innit? Or where? I say Kingston. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Where would you say? <laughs> Overcliff. <laughs> <laughs> where would you say? Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Where would you say? I'd say when I was growing up, the capital of reggae was actually England, and I'd say now it's probably, to me, Germany. Oh, wow. Yeah. The capital of, of reggae music was Northwest Ten. So all the pressing plants was in Northwest 10, all the top shops was in Northwest 10, the distribution was in Northwest 10. So if you're going to say where's the capital, look at where the main branches are, which was Arsenal. Okay. Jetstar. Northwest 10. Jetstar, yeah? Yes. yes. It's on, on to Jetstar. Jetstar. Tell me how Jetstar affected and helped you grow as artists and as businessmen. Jack and Tommy, and then we'll come into you, Dean. Well, Jetstar... I got an uncle who was in the music business as well. He was Gark, he's a DJ. He now lives in Florida, but you know when you're doing music, your family is trying to help you out. So he was like, go and check Mr. Palmer. Go and check Mr. Palmer over Northwest London. But so me and Jack went over there. But he weren't ready for what he was on. It was like UK rap. He was he was pressing 12-inch reggae tunes. He was on D Row mode, but you know, but D Row was sealed so no war go on in the future. But Mr. Palmer didn't see that, so he was like, um, I'm not really messing with it, but to your uncle sent me down, I'm going to send someone to come and watch your shows and that. But I don't think they were ready for it at the time. But yeah, so, but Mr. Palmer, he was a good guy, a good man though, good man. He was been the press of our music for us as well. But at the time, it was a different angle where we were going in, but 
Mr. Palmer was a good man. So tell me how people like Mr. Palmer, I suppose the closest person to a Mr. Palmer from our community, apart from d Rowe, was probably someone like Eni. He was of the younger generation, right? Yeah, so Eni was a different one of Mr. Palmer to me. So like our, my even my next stage in music was that. So me and Jack was doing a Blue Barrel thing for ages. Then Jack took time off for a minute as well again. <laughs> <laughs> he took another time off and then I remember we was <laughs> sorry brother let's be honest <laughs> I remember we was actually on stage together and the time off was starting the next day so I was thinking to myself where do I go from here like what do I do so I'm sitting down in my house between my thumbs thinking you know what am I going to do then any he gave me a call and was like in New Cross Gate where Eni's from They've got a new charity around there, new deal for communities. They're looking for artists to work with, whatnot. So I went around there, and that was how I, my next step, how I continued. So Eni was like, he had his ear to the street. He knew about everything music-wise, and he was always willing to bring people in, you know, like getting where you're fitting. So that was how Eni was to me. He was like a guy that would give me links to music that I really, really did really really needed to be at that time specifically as well because like i said chat was away and he was like what am i going to do next so yeah so any is that guy to me would you say he helped put together infrastructure yeah, of course he did. any is a reason for grime music in the area i don't care what noah's got to say to me but when it comes to essentials fallen angels that's little d your p money your blacks you know to me that's because in south East, East really was running grime, right? Let's be honest. East London, they were really running grime. Over here, we're more reggae and rap. So we never really, like, I never really had no interest in grime. I only was interested in helping the kids that were doing grime because I knew them. So that was my whole idea. But any was, he was basically us on the grime scene. This is what I was trying to say. Yeah. So every generation, yeah, every decade, we get a new genre of music that we obviously bad up because we've always run things from Saxon up until now. And this is why I put the clashes in the um, screening room because you can see from Saxon up until P Money doing the Big H thing. Like, we've always run things and you can see it for every genre, be it drum and bass, Garage, rap, rap, rap grime, rap, rap, rap. even now with drill. drill. Rush is Russia's from Russia's Grove Park, bro. He's, a, he's a, claiming Blue Bar as well. Like, dig that, he's from Deptford. Like, we're still running things. So it's imperative that we always have that at, at the forefront of our mind. We've come from a strong heritage, strong lineage. And that's probably why we're such strong performers and artists. So for you as elders, like, what would you, uh, if you had to give any advice to anyone up and coming, what would you say? Because obviously we've got to wrap this up before we do the awards. <laughs> well, advice to young people is like determination. That's the first thing. Because there will be times when it ain't going the way you want it to go. You know, then there's, with that comes with sticking to the, sticking to the plan. You know, sticking to the plan. And also be professional. Because a lot of opportunities that I've lost personally, were for me worried about what my friends think or trying to be loyal to a street code or something like that and it closed doors on you so think corporate you know look at Fecky over there thanks I Fecky that's my guy Fecky there like, you know what I mean like and that's, I'll be very brief so that's, a, that's another story like Fecky's a guy that knocked my door with Cole Leon and they were doing what they were doing and they were like we want to do music I was like okay and the, the journey has been crazy the man's a superstar, trying to say, and they're coming from the mud, and this is just determination, determination. This is the first time I've seen him in years. <laughs> That's our Wiley. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? But the growth, but the growth is amazing in where we come from. It's just amazing that he's got a charity now where we come from, and we're here now in the, in the legendary Golders University. And we're having this moment today on Black History Month, called it Blue History Month, you know? So it's a blessing. Like I said, so my advice is stick together and determination and show love to your elders. Respect your elders, please. <laughs> well, what I could say is for the younger generation is to have a four hour pack, yeah? Which means you can have eight people working for you but they're working at f for four hours at different times a day, so no one's not getting in no one's way. And that's the best way for now, yeah? 
for you can get his recognition. Because if you keep seeing something on the internet, you're going to click onto it. And that's a fact. There is nothing else you can do apart from if you're going to book someone to do that job for you. But if you're not, then get eight people, say four hours a day, you do this. You're all in the room, you all know what you're doing. So you do it, you do it in four hours. You know? So, <laughs> yeah. So really, that's my idea of giving to you to have a four hour pack. Yeah, if you can have if you can have 30 people doing four hours a day, that is a lot of people. And that's a lot of work. Because if everybody sends out, in, the, in four hours, if everybody sends out 20,000 messages, that's a great look. So that's what I would tell a youth now. If a youth wants to do music, he's got to have that package around him. He doesn't need to have goons around him. He just needs to have people that want the same thing as him. Because even you pushing the song makes you big as well. So the artist is getting big and everyone's getting paid for what they're doing. Because if you're posting that and money's coming in, you're going to get paid from whatever, you know, if the man them are serious from their heart from the beginning. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, 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 we'll do this all together. And when the money starts coming in, <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. It happens, it happens. I know this. I, I, I've been around it all my life. Snakes and rats. All my life. And, and I wouldn't say anything different from that because sometimes, you know, like you're with somebody every day and you think he's on the same thing as what you're on until the time comes where he's got that in his pocket. Then the, the, the story changes again. <laughs> you know, like, so we, we must understand that if we want to do something and we're going to start from ground zero, just let's just have a deal around the table. So when the money starts coming in, we can all get our little piece. That's why I say the four-hour camp. You don't need no one to work for you for eight hours. Eight hours is too much. Four hours is even too much. But in that four hours, you can get a lot done. You know what I mean? So if, 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 if a youth needs to hear anything more than that, he's not really wanting to do this thing. This is about doing this thing, understanding this thing. Because I think... Maybe I could be a granddad in this thing, because I've been there that long. Yeah, 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 so I could say I'm a granddad. So the youths of today, they have a different view from me. So sometimes when I would speak to them, they won't hear me. But the clear thing is, I've told you. And if you don't follow it, then it's your problem. I'm not going to say, do this, do that. I'm going to say, get a four hour pack. And that's me out. Uh, my, uh, my name is Dennis Rowe. So um, I don't have all these Instagrams and all that, but that's my name, Dennis Rowe. I'll probably say um, what I'd normally say is a hard work. It's not even just hard work, working sensibly, that's the first thing. But some people think they're going to come in the game and get a one tune and it's going to be e some people think music is easy it's not it's cutthroat you've got to work hard and if you're not working hard even if you do bust you ain't going to get to the degree or because nothing don't really drop in your lap in the music business like like that you have to kind of keep at it it's going to give you more downs than ups but some of them ups can be tremendous you understand and some of them um some of the memories you get from it. <laughs> Busy man, he's in it, that should be known, isn't it? But anyways, um, some of the memories and some of the places you get to go, you would have never have gone. That's the one thing I liked about music. That's one of the goals I set for myself in music because I was going away before music. I, I never waited to live my life. I wasn't one of them artists that was broken and got in music and then all of a sudden started driving cars and now nah, I was living before. But what I was doing was going to the same places, having the same experiences, and I was dying for music, for my voice to put me on a plane and take me some places. And boy, took me some places I would have never have gone, broadened me, made me know some people I would have never have known. Do you know what I mean? And you can't stay here and think you know what's going on in another country because you've read a book or you've seen on TV. 
yeah, you have to kind of go there. And I ended up in places like, I took a booking for Lebanon once, yeah, and I'm fast. So as soon as they came and said, Lebanon, I said, yeah. The money, money was good. I said, yeah, all right, cool. Some um, big Arab people want to take you out. I was like, yeah, 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 cool. Everything's good. Got the itinerary back, and it said you land in Beirut. I said, I forgot that Beirut's in Lebanon. <laughs> it's kicking off over there at that time too, isn't it? So I'm telling my mum, she said, where you, where you doing? Where you going? And I went, I, said, I went places like, I went Poland, certain places, and I'm like, I'm the only black man there. It's yoga, and it's like, and if you know me, I'm not having it wherever I am on the globe, so I'm just hoping I don't see something. You know what I mean? I always said I'd never go to Germany, but then I ended up going to Germany. It's one of my favorite places to go. Do you know what I mean? Um, ended up going to Africa. Wasn't even really booked to do no shows in Africa. I ended up doing some stuff in Africa, and it was just like, wow. Do you see what I'm saying? So I'd say you have to work hard. You have to know that it's not going to drop in your lap. And when you're going through, another thing that you should do, help people. Car, uh, one minute you're there, next minute that person's there. And I'll say it, it's mad, it's fitting that we're here in this actual place. Because I helped him out, yeah, at the start. Then he said that he was dealing with these, um, remember the charity, the artifacts? So he kind of, they were doing, they wanted someone to come and do some lyric writing stuff with young people in the Blue Bar. So he came to me with it, and I started doing lyric writing at university. Right here, full circle, yeah? Which led me on to start mentoring young people through music, building um, studio in approved. I just went on and done so much things from that. I used it as a springboard, and I'm still kind of using music in everything I do, and it's a springboard and it brings back so much to me. You understand, I'm a grown man. I ain't done music properly, like being out there doing music for a long time. But music won't leave me alone. I've always got people wanting to do shows. Someone came to me, I had a meeting last week and these people wanted to do an album again. I'm like, what do you want? Huh? But this thing won't leave me alone, you understand? And I won't leave it alone. And it started from Deptford, New Cross and Saxon Studio. So it's a full, circle and I'm seeing some other people in this room that are part of it because we're all like certain men don't know I'm part of their history and that's the they, they cook up they cook on what interview they want and say this person started them relative they don't understand where branches all off the same tree all, and they yeah. don't know who I influenced that influenced them or who sat who slept on my sofa or whoever I did whatever I did that's in the music game now giving them an opportunity mm. you see what I'm saying so a lot of people don't realize it's a train ride yeah and we all get on the train at different places so sometimes when i'm when i want to inquire about certain things yeah i've got a long memory and i was out early so i remember a lot i know a lot of people but i don't know everything so when it comes to certain things i'd ask some i'd ask a d-roll i'd ask some muscle I'd ask a Levi if I had access because they was on the train ride before me. Do you understand? So what you're doing and saying how long um, our musical heritage and our history around here and what you're highlighting today, brilliant. You know what I mean? Enough respect, much respect to you because I keep on saying it's not documented. You've got Philip Levy over there standing up on the thing, going on like he ain't no one. And if you know half of the artists in the borough are related to this man half of the wicked mic man in the borough are related to this dude yeah you got you got people like you got people like who um what's the dude's name Wycliffe and them man there teeth in his style and putting it on records that went all over the world international pop smashes you got a bagger man that came with his style his pattern the fast style the, the rapid speed chat came from Saxon. Went to Yard, dominated Yard. Levi was the first, I think, non-Jamaican to be number one in Jamaica. Yeah, I used to go trading, trading their sound tapes like currency. You don't understand that. We got, we got heritage and 
Certain people are walking around some past some dons every day and don't know you're walking past a don that put you on and you don't know. So sometimes when certain people are talking that's been here longer than you, big up Craze 24 too. Big up Bada, the internet sensation in the building. Big up Fecky too, because see Fecky, you've taken the bat and you've gone far. Big up Ian Ryan, who's actually Maxi Priest's son. Yeah? So we got big up Taz, I see you up there. Big up, where's Leela Singh? I see you up there too. Big executive. Look, 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 we're all branches of the same tree and don't, no one ever get it twisted. Some of the people that came before you was better than you, but the game weren't set up yet. They didn't have no one putting no money into them. When they was doing things, there was no doors open to them. They was trying to lock them out. Yeah, some of these men sold more than artists now. You understand? You got certain artists now, they're going on big because they're... They got uh, a million hits and views. Some of that ain't transferring into money in their pocket. Yeah. When we was, I'm part of a, a project that's still selling. It's 200,000 copies in excess of 200,000 copies. I still get royalties off of that now. I got music on on manga cartoons. I got music on film soundtracks in Canada. Still getting PRS royalties, mechanicals and stuff like that. So. People need to understand the game. You need to understand what's gone before and show it some respect. I've been going on too long now. Afterwards, I would like everyone to join me in the atrium because we've got our lovely deputy mayor and our speaker that have joined us to hand out the awards for today. So, literally, after Jack, everyone into the cinema room. Thank you. All right, cool. I'll just keep it brief. I'd just like to say to anyone thinking of getting involved in anything, especially to do with music, just don't be afraid to take risks like... Yeah, you have a structure, but just don't be afraid to take risks. Be creative. Give yourself space to be creative. Don't worry what's popular. Just be creative. Like, think outside of the box. Like, don't join the rat race. Just be creative. Work together. Blue Bar is officially back in the building. <laughs> so, the last thing I should say, I should have said what Scheme said. Yeah, Levi's over there hiding. But, but the thing is, a lot of people really don't know Rees, but he's had the longest hit tune in Jamaica from 1983 till today. I mean, it's not the hit song, but it plays every day in Jamaica. So that is a bigger thing than having a hit song for six weeks. So let me pass this mic over. Thank you everyone for turning up today. And as I said, if you just join me in the cinema room, and then we can award you the James on the map, got the city locked, waiting to snatch whatever we drop. Got danger and hat. Yo, you slipping and sliding, your whole crew's dipping and diving. I sit in the whip and I'm gripping the iron. I'm sick and I'm tired of niggas that spit lies And they sit on the strip and they flip pies I live this, is big business, I is this shit You little waste men, you witnessed it From your bedroom window, tech boom, give feds info To make room for you and your kinfolk But your plan never worked, turned to a prick That lives with a chick, stays under a skirt These are thunderous words, the best form of defense is attack Black Jack, muzzle your first, wasn't the type to stop and just nurse I was the type of nigga to flop on a nigga of Pop of a person, now I stop on your block and I clock and I lurk And then I'm popping my clock and I'm watching you splurt We spit flames on the track, on a level that they're aiming to match SE1, 4, slash 8, names on the map